Hello and welcome to the Master Art Series, which is made possible by a grant from the Naperville Sunrise Rotary Club. I'm your host, Barry Skirkus. On a trip to Ketchikan, Alaska, I had the opportunity to meet Dolores Churchill in her studio. She allowed me to videotape our chat so I could share it with you. Dolores is a weaver from the Haida tribe. She travels extensively as she teaches, learns, and shares her art. We also talked about her family and her memories. Please join me now in the studio of Dolores Churchill. Can you explain a little bit about all the different symbols on one of well, these? Yeah, I'll tell you about this one. This one is um, the Pit uh, River apron. It's in the, at the Pit River in in London and in the museum there. And this is a diving whale. See the whale's tail up there? Uh -huh. It's split. See, that's right. the whale's tail. And that faces its stomach. Right. And then uh, these are its blowholes right here. Okay. And those are its flukes. So it's called a diving whale. Oh. And the uh, image of the face in the center? That's, that's a stomach. Okay. Okay. That's wonderful. It's never what, what you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> Those are beautiful. Yeah, that, that belongs in, the, in fact, there it is. That's in Dr. White's collection. He's an uh, orthodontist that lives in Juneau. Mm -hmm. I did this picture of it. That's gorgeous. And what, what material did you make this out of? This is made out of Australian merino and then the deer leather and deer toes. Our these hats made from those hat forms over there? No, um, those hat forms are from, there was um, a man found in a glacier and um, he, uh, he was like um, 500 years old. Somebody just recently was telling me they found out that he actually was 10,000, but I don't have any documentation or any proof mm -hmm. yet. But they found him in the Tuscanini uh, valley and uh, river and let's see. I'm in here somewhere. Oh, right here. Oh, yeah. yeah. And there's the hat. And I replicated the hat. Mm -hmm. And it's in a show in Kenai right now. It's right there. Oh, very nice. So this is the one that they found? Uh huh. And then this is your duplication. Right. Wonderful. And did you use the same type of materials? And I did. Uh -huh. And what is this? And actually even counted the... Oh, you counted uh, all the different uh, right. rows? Right. And uh, but I wouldn't have been able to do it without this young Frances Olness. She's a uh, champion Asiac, but she's also part Tlingit. Uh -huh. And this Tlingit woman, Ruth, I would never have been able to go into their territory because they were very... When this hat was still avail was still out, they were really superstitious. People had died, and they didn't want us to touch it or see it. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank goodness, this Tlingit elder, who probably is, uh, you know, a, that was her ancestor that had that hat. Mm -hmm. They found his body. The article just tells all about. It. They found his body in a crevasse, and. Uh, the hat, the, when they were landing in the helicopter, the hat was the first thing they saw. Okay. He had tools too, and he had a ground squirrel cape. Mm hmm. Um, Very nice. And what material was this made spruce out of? Spruce root. Spruce root. Very nice. And these are similar type of hat forms? That uh, they were, but they, none of them worked out because, as you can see, well, I can't really see from that, but that hat really came out more like this. Okay. And um, so, um, you know, it's it's close, but not close enough. I wouldn't let them use it. I just I paid to have the forms made, but they were not right. Okay. So I never used them. And how long did it take you to make your duplicate of this hand? Well, it really took three years because I didn't work on it all the time. Because I teach, you know, I teach two weeks at the university. Like just last month, I taught two weeks in at Juneau at the University of Alaska campus for two mm -hmm. weeks. And then I went to a village and I taught there actually for two weeks, but I had to fly to um, 
Rapid City, South Dakota, because I got some kind of an award. How nice! <laughs> so, three thousand dollar award. So I flew back. Oh, that well, that's worth flying there for. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I went back there, and I'm going to be. My daughter and I are going to be taking pictures of the collection in Ottawa with that money. Excellent, excellent. This is very nice. This uh -huh. is very nice. Right. Can you tell you know, a little bit about this hat that you have on this poster here? Oh, that hat. I there was a hat like that that was in a, in someone's house in Sitka, and uh, Steve Hendrickson from the museum, the woman brought it out, and it was really dirty. It wasn't the, the like this looks. It was really dirty, and and he brought it to the museum, cleaned it. It went out for auction just a few months ago, and the museum in um, Anchorage and Kodiak purchased it for $170,000 at um, one of the, uh, which one was it? It wasn't Christie's, I think it was one of the, the other one. Southby's? Southby's, yes. So that went for a lot of money, but that one, I think, is... Oh, it's at the Smithsonian. Okay. That's where Nathan is right now. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh-huh. And then my friend Edna made this. I taught the class and taught them how to make these, this rope. And so I was telling them that when a man was angry, he wore it in the front so that, or he was going to war, he wore it in the front. And if he was content with what he was doing, he wore it in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a signal, really, of, you know... Of a person's of mood. Of a person's mood, or, right. And that's made out of... Red cedar. Red cedar again? Uh -huh. That's very nice. And how do you get the, uh, the cedar bark so fine? Is it because of the... Is it split? A long, a long time ago, they used to... When my, my first started teaching with my mother... They used to use their thumbnail like a tool, mm -hmm. and they would just split it down when it's dry, mm -hmm. and make these thin pieces. They made them so even; it's incredible. That um, is. After well, after a while, I found out that you could use a leather stripper. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we modernized economy it. Economy of time. Right. <laughs> economy of time. Right. That's very nice. I see you have a baleen back there. Right. That was given to me by a woman who. In fact, I'm returning it to her granddaughter who works at the university. Um, she felt that her family was not really interested in these Indian artifacts, and so she gave it to me. In fact, she gave me a necklace. You know, the Aleut people were taken from their villages when the Japanese attacked right. uh, their area. So they moved them all down here. And this old woman from St. George Island was living in Wrangell. And um, her husband used to bring fish in. And sometimes, you know, if a, if a seal bites it or if, it's, if a fish is not perfect, they don't, can't sell it at the cannery. So she would bring it to this real old um, Aleut woman. And so when they were being sent back to their land after the war, then the Aleut woman gave her baleen and she gave her also a necklace, a really beautiful amber necklace that came from Russia. And um, I, I put it on once and I felt really uncomfortable. I thought, it's not mine. Mm -hmm. So one, a few years ago, I heard that the Aleuts were taking um, objects that they had when they were taken down here and put in these camps. And I thought, wow, that would be a great memory for the woman. So I sent her necklace back, but I kept these, and I'm really glad I did because I was telling, her granddaughter goes to my church, and I was telling her, you know, I have some baleen that your grandmother gave me. Oh, I'd love to have it. Oh, <laughs> so I'm giving her one. I'm keeping the other. Yeah, during that time, didn't they establish a uh, military base at uh, Dutch Harbor? They did, and you know, they were really badly treated. I don't think every, everyone knows how badly they were treated. Their military stole a lot of their artifacts, icons from their churches, and, and then 
those that were in Japan were really badly treated. They were like put in cages so people could come and look at them in cages. Oh, and, and you know, the day they were freed, it was really amazing. Not very far from them was an Orthodox church because they're Russian Orthodox. And here they walked down and there was a Greek Orthodox church. And they were so thankful that many of them died. And oh, so geez. those that lived were so thankful that they were free. But they're very bitter about the Japanese. No, I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. What are these two items hanging over well, this is by the uh, uh, I, dream catcher? <laughs> okay. This is um, um, when I first start learning to do chillcat weaving. She made us do really simple things, but it wasn't that simple. <laughs> and actually, this was the first one I did. I had been studying in, in London. I had been studying the basketry, Haida basketry in London. And when I came home, uh, Nathan Jackson's wife called me. And she said, you know, Dolores, Cheryl Samuel is going to be here teaching Chilcat. I said, look, my brain is so full of things that I learned, I, and I have to document them and write a journal, and I have no time. Well, she said, I'll oh, know more than you do. So I, um, so I joined the class. Oh, it's and dark and twisted your arm. <laughs> and then I, I got halfway through, and I said to um, Cheryl, I said, I'm like, I'm in love. I can't sleep. I can't eat. All I think about is that weaving. It's so much fun. Mm -hmm. So I said, have you ever taken an apprentice? And she said, no. I said, but are you willing? She said, yes. And again, I called the State Arts Council. I, I asked her how much she would charge. She asked me, how much should I charge? I said, well, how much do you charge for your aprons? Because she had finished an apron. She said, well, I sold one to Hunt for $4,000. I said, okay, that's what we'll pay you, $4,000. <laughs> so two of us went, and I paid her two, and the other woman paid her two. But by the time, about, I guess I went there in January, and then in April my mother got cancer, and so I came home to take care of her. And then I went back the next year and finished the apprenticeship, and so it you know, it really took six months to finish the apron, but I, by then I had no more money, <laughs> and I was, I got a call from the museum in Anchorage, and they asked if I would work there for a week demonstrating, and so I said, oh yeah, I need money. So, <laughs> and as I was flying up to Anchorage, this man that was sitting next to me kept trying to talk, but I was... I had, Cheryl had me studying all these, it's a huge book, I don't even know where it is, it's somewhere around here, but she had me studying this huge book with all her notes, and so I put the book down, had to go to the washroom, and came back, and she said, now I know who you are, you're Cheryl Samuel, and I said, no I'm not, <laughs> I said, she's, she's the one that wrote this book that I'm having to read, <laughs> and so he said, well, he said, you know, um, I'm, I'm the director of Chevron USA in Anchorage, and we're funding this museum exhibit. I said, oh, you are? <laughs> he said, then, what can I do for you? Can you give me a thousand dollars? He said, okay. He said, my wife and I will come and see you this evening at the exhibit. And they did. He came with a thousand dollar check from the U. Chevron USA. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. That's <laughs> excellent. That's a great story. That's wonderful. And then I got another thousand from another um, excellent Indian organization. So. Can you tell us about your uh, loom here? Yeah. The looms are just really simple. They're just a bar loom. There's no weights involved at all. And when you're weaving, you put, like, when I'm weaving on this, I keep this covered usually. And then when, I'm, when you're weaving, now we put funny socks on them, but they used to put gut bags, and we put them in there so they'll keep clean, because cleanliness was really an important part of weaving. And when you're not weaving, you cover it totally. You don't let any dust or anything go on it. It's um, one of the things, the first rules they have of basketry and of weaving is have your house clean. That's why I've worked on it. <laughs> your house should be clean, right. just like, because when you work, it's like being, it's it's like, um, I think 
the same thing that people do in India, you know, when you're when you're weaving, you're thinking only good thoughts, and if you think bad thoughts, then your weaving goes off. So, mm -hmm. so you don't do any weaving if you're feeling sad or, or you always have mood, to be happy right. when you come to the loom. I listen to classical music when I'm weaving. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's excellent. Um, what type of stitch? How many different types of stitches have you? Accumulated over the years. Well, with the um, with the endings in basketry, I'm the only one that knows 17 endings. That's why I'm writing this book because uh, you know there isn't anyone that has that. So I'm writing a book on Haida basketry. I got a grant from the State Arts Council uh, for 2,500 for computer equipment, and then I got this 3,000 from this. Um, First People's Fund out of South Dakota, which I'll be using to go and take pictures in the museum in Ottawa mm -hmm. of the Haida basketry. Then I'll be working on that on that basketry. But this is going to be in a show in New York. It's a cover of a chief's chair. It's not a very big chair. Mm -hmm. and the first uh, woman I apprenticed under was my mother. Mm -hmm. And actually, how that happened, I used to be the bookkeeper at. Ketchikan General Hospital was assistant to the controller, would you believe it? And my mother was doing basketry for years. Even when we were children, she did basketry. And um, we used baskets when we went clam digging, the clam digging, clam baskets. And we had berry baskets. And so I, I took a class when I was a little girl, and um, I wouldn't listen to her because your first basket has to be cylindrical. Well, I don't know whether mine was convex or concave, <laughs> but I wouldn't listen because she was in the classroom. It was actually students who didn't speak English very well. We understood it, but we didn't speak it very well, mm -hmm. so they wanted us to do something we were really familiar with. Well, toward the end of the class, the homeroom teacher came in and said, you know, um, there's a basketry show in Victoria in the 1930s, five dollars was a lot of money. Oh, the yes. first prize was five dollars. Well, I said, could I take my basket undone to my mother? And she said, no, it's too late. And then when they were packing the baskets to ship off to Victoria, BC, my uh, mother said, don't put hers in. I think it was something like this one, probably. That the <laughs> first basket's always like this. Peter Corey did this one for me. But, Anyway, <clears throat> that was my first basket, and um, then the prize money came back. You won't believe it. Guess who won first prize? I did. <laughs> oh, you did? <laughs> what did your mother say? <laughs> well, she called me to the front of the class, and she pinned the blue ribbon on me, and then she called this girl whose name was Sylvia Kelly. She said, Sylvia Kelly, come to the front of the class. And Sylvia came and she gave her the five dollars. I got the blue ribbon. Oh, I took okay. Took the blue ribbon and I threw it down. I stopped on it. Oh. I'll never weave again. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I was, um, I guess I was forty-two, and this collector, my mother had sold him one of her hats. I don't have one of her hats here. I had it here, but I don't know what I did with it. But anyway, he, the collector wrote and sent me this basket and he said, when Ida Bensel, the Silet's woman, she was 92, when she died, the art of Silet's basketry would die with her. Well, my husband was Caucasian and he was listening to the letter and he said, Dolores, he said, you have to learn to weave. He said, it's gonna die just like the Silet's basketry. And I said, well, I'm doing budgets right now. I'm sure his sister won't let me off. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, you could try. So I went up to his sister, and he must have talked to her first because she said yes right away. And so anyway, I went, walked into the classroom, and she said she was teaching at the university here. It was actually Ketchikan Community College then. Mm -hmm. And I walked into the classroom, and she said, what do you do here? I said, I'm going to weave. No. You know, look. I sit there and weave. You know, look. Go on, go home. And I didn't know what to do because I'd never answered her back. No, even no matter, as bratty as I was as a child, I never answered. So I stood there for a while, and then the head of the art department walked in, and he said, what's going on? I said, she doesn't want me in the class. He went over to her, he put his arm around her, and he said, Selena, we need her registration. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> but she took my basket and she made me take it undone. I bet a hundred times. It was terrible. Oh, it's almost so. like a ceramicist when a, a ceramics instructor is teaching a student. All of a sudden, they get so far, and you can see it's either too thick at the base or they they don't have the right pull. You just take it off and say, start over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what do some of the patterns indicate? And what dyes are used in, in some of this? Okay, this one is red cedar bark. And this is the first woman, other than my mother, the next woman that I learned from. Her name was Flora Mather. And this is typically Simsian. It's red cedar warp and red cedar weaving. Mother's was, she was the first one to use yellow cedar. She used to use spruce root. Mm -hmm. And then she used yellow cedar warp or yellow, red cedar warp and yellow cedar weaving. These people never use the yellow cedar. I think because so many people are allergic to it. Mm -hmm. But she was the first woman, and it, made it, it makes it so much easier to teach because um, yellow cedar just feels just like leather where red cedar is always woody. Okay. But she took this design off a ski cap. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what uh, makes this black? Oh, well, that's maidenhair fern. That's, right now is the time when we're harvesting it. And this one was made by a Haida that uh, took my class. He is really a good weaver, um, Clarence Peel. I, they call him Sunson. Everybody in Heidelberg has a nickname, so mm -hmm. he did this. And it's, this is called Ayurunga in our language, or Cresting Wave, where the wave crests. Oh, okay. And then my grandson did this one, and... Um, this friend of mine that was the head of the art department now works in the polar research at the university in Fairbanks and he saw this in a shop and he bought it for me and gave it to me and here my grandson tried to take it back and I said it's not yours. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not That's pretty me. funny so you got one of your grandson's weavings from right. a friend. <laughs> right and he his totem pole is there you know, did you see it? It's at it's the one that as you come in, it's the one on that. When you come in, it's the one on the right hand side. Um, we were there several years ago, so. Oh, I can't see. No, it's it's just new. He just, oh, it's they new? just put it up. Yeah. Okay, we'll we'll definitely go and see it. And this is uh, Nutrana. They used to call them Nutka. And this woman was on Vancouver Island, and I was there, and uh, I wanted to buy this basket off of her. And so I went to her, and she didn't speak English, but she understood. I asked to buy it, and I was going to write a check, and she, she wanted money. <laughs> 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 but it's a beautiful basket, and she was 90 when she did this. It's exquisite. And yes, it is. It's beautiful. What, what, how did they get the blue on this? Do you know? I really don't know what kind of dye she uses. We use blueberries, and, mm -hmm. and we also... Uh, Although, you know, I really am against um, chemical dyes because you have to use such uh, mineral dyes because you have to use such harsh chemicals. Right. So I usually use maidenhair fern or alder bark. I don't, um, I don't use those harsh chemicals. Well, a lot of uh, uh, weavers today are opposed to that. They usually use the organic uh, right. dyes. Right, or aniline dyes. Right. Yeah. And this is what I just use people, when I'm teaching people, this is the one I use. It's easy to t teach. And then this one is Eskimo. This is from um, Hooper Bay. They're the best weavers. And uh, this one's from Hooper Bay, too. And they're really good weavers. And this is seal gut. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how they dye it either, so I won't pretend I know. This is beautiful. And this is from Bethel area. That's beautiful. And these are from Indonesia. My friend goes to Indonesia every year. So she knows I love baskets. And this one's kind of a neat one. It's, oh, well, it's got gorgeous. basketry inside and beaded on the outside. And that's from Indonesia? Uh-huh. Beautiful. Yeah. I've never and seen anything like that this before. This is Athabascan, and this was done by Belle Deacon. And, and I tried to pay her for it, uh, but she wouldn't let me pay for it. It was yeah. it was nineteen ninety nine. I think they're really expensive now. And that's it's birch bark. Yeah, that's birch bark. And the outside is. You it's know? spruce root. Spruce root. Right. 
I, I started one, and she knew I taught, and she said, you're really good at it, so I want you to promise that you'll never teach anyone else. So I stopped midway when mm -hmm. she told me. I just stopped, because her daughter, Belle Deacon, teaches. And that's how Native people used to do it. They never, they never passed it on to other people. It always went through their family. Mm -hmm. And so my teaching at the university is, when my mother started teaching, I'm glad I wasn't her because I don't know if I could have put up with it. She was called and told that she shouldn't really be doing it, that she shouldn't teach a Native art. It was, she had a hard time. I bought this one at That was beautiful. I was I got, noticing that in there. I got that at Ye old Curiosity Shop in Seattle. Oh. I, I hope the man never hears what I have. But <laughs> it was full of dust, and this edge was all broken up. And so I looked at it, and then I put it back, and then I walked away. He said, would you consider buying that basket? I said, it's pretty badly damaged. And he said, I'll give it to you for $25. I said, gee, I don't know. I don't really know if I want it. I'm just dying. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, he said, $20. I'm not going any lower than that. So, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what the uh, heritage of that uh, particular oh, piece is? Oh, it's Nuchanas too. And this, uh, I talked to the Nuchanas people. These are, are the rocks and these are algae on the rocks. Oh, okay. And other, another one told me there were waves, so I don't know. They all have different names. Yeah, and this is one that Florence Davidson, she was a famous weaver, and she did this for me. That's beautiful. And I love this one. One of the Eskimos up in Bethel gave that to my mother as a gift, and she called it Northern Lights. Oh, it does look like that. Yeah, it does. It's so beautiful. And then I thought that you know, this kind of weaving was really easy, so I decided I'd try it. It wasn't that easy. I gave, I gave up after one basket and decided I better stick with twining. <laughs> so the sewing weaving ends up. That's my only one attempt at it. I found out those people who do these are really talented. Because mm -hmm. it looks so simple, because right. all you do is go round and round. But everything has to be the same thickness, the same width, and you can't. What about this little one on the end over here? Oh, oh that's, that's, that right. again is a nutka. Mm -hmm. Or an, it might be macaw because of, because they did um, the same as the Nuchana people. And this one, I'm sure is probably from Nia Bay. Beautiful. Very nice. And the last thing I'm curious about is this brush. Oh, the comb. Yes. That's from Indonesia. That's my friend. She works at the uh, she works at the um, gallery downtown. She's got her masters in fiber arts. I don't know what she's doing working down there, but she is. Who's that? And, uh, Kathy Russo. Mm -hmm. She goes to she goes to Guatemala all the all the time, and um, I have some of her fibers here that I'm returning to her because when I was going to do that. Um, when I was going to do that armor, I actually was going to use some of this material that she gets from Guatemala. In fact, she had some made up for me. Where is it? Huh. Now you're going to mess up your whole studio. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here it is. But they thigh spin it like we thigh spin ours. Isn't mm -hmm. that beautiful? That's gorgeous. And that's this material. And how do you have a spinning wheel to do this or no you just thigh spin it I'll have to show you they do the same way we do that's beautiful yeah so she made she got that for me but um, I decided against armor I've got enough work in my life to do without doing that but I'll have to show you how the technique that they use for spinning this is just merino But you know, all the patterns are really mathematical. It's, 
you know, they said Native people didn't know math. But to get this pattern in, oh, definitely. You, have, you have to have mathematics to all fit together. Right, because if you can't calculate the circumference, it will the design pattern will get thinner and thicker. Right. And the same thing with this. You need to if you didn't know mathematics, you couldn't put those little designs in that right. are above. That's gorgeous. The dice pin, it's really simple. You just hold on to it, take it apart. That's how they made twine and the warp for and the warp for the weaving. Oops. You have to hold on to it to get it to do it. Oh, that's... That looks so easy. <laughs> <laughs> if I tried to do that, I'd be here all day. <laughs> okay, and then you let it go, and I come back. Okay. Okay, you want to try? Sure. <laughs> okay, sit down like this. Uh -huh. Put my finger here, right? Uh, but be sure to separate them because they'll come back on one okay, another. Okay, separate them. And, and then, then and go down with your middle, do I lift, with do your I middle finger. Hang on to that though. Not okay. like that. Like that. Okay. Go like this. Down. Down. You're oh. bringing it back. Okay. Try that again. No. Start up and then go down. Yeah. Okay. This way. Uh oh. I'm gonna fail this course. <laughs> <laughs> now let go of that. Oh, here, it, you did. Beautiful. Now I'll bring it back. Now I'll bring it back. Not there, but okay. here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I put a little knot in it. Yeah. <laughs> I wrecked yours. <laughs> I'll have to try that again. Yeah, I'll practice that down. at home. <laughs> Take that, you can Okay, practice. thank you. Thank you. something to do on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody will be watching me on the plane going home. And where do you get your uh, uh, merino wool from? Well, we used to get it from the shop in, on Vancouver Islands, and it's getting harder and harder to get. I'm really lucky that Dr. White, who bought that, was in Australia and brought bought me just a lot of it. This is just, I have a trunk full. These are, they come in these big spools. You have to keep them covered so they don't get dusty. Right. This <laughs> oh, that's a big skein. Yeah, they're huge skeins. But I was very fortunate that he bought these for me because now people are having a hard time getting it and I'm really lucky we get it in the blue. But they do oh, 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 so. there goes. Uh oh. This is the this um, stick they use when they do the Chilcat robes. Like you know how they how the robes come down? Mm -hmm. You do this first for the side, then you go a little further over and this is the middle right here. Mm -hmm. So the length of it goes like so. That's what that's. So how long have you been teaching at the uh, university at uh, Ketchikan? Since the 70s. Sometime in the 70s I started. And then, but I didn't teach in Sitka till the 80s. And I think in Juneau probably the 80s. But I started here first at the university, at Ketchikan Community College. So have you had any of your students uh, get any notoriety? Oh yeah, um, mm. Diane Willard is famous for her weaving, and uh, Jan Criswell, who teach, is also teaching at the university now mm -hmm. in Juneau. And um, there's quite a few other people. My daughter, Holly, is teaching, and like I said, she's being videotaped for Canadian Broadcasting this week. And Are you going to get a copy of the tape? <laughs> yeah, they were pretty good about giving good. us copies. Good. Yeah, and um, yeah, I have quite a few. Um, there's one woman in Wrangell Bay Court that sells her a, a lot of her artwork and and uh, so there's lots of people that are doing it now, which is really nice. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. That's excellent. And some people I really admire only do it for their own. Like there's Helen uh, Watkins 
that her husband is teaches native art. He's white, but he teaches native art at the university in Juneau. And when she does a basket, it's not for sale. No. She's going to pick berries or she's going to do something with it. It's really, I think, I don't have, I can't even afford my own baskets. You can see I have don't have very many baskets <laughs> of my own because they're like, um, you know, one of my hats, I just sold them for $5,000. So they don't sit around here. Oh, it's, that's excellent. Yeah, it's that one I showed you in the book. This one is in the show in Kenai. That one. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. And this one went for 1200 So you can tell that I can't afford my own work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think most artists can. How many uh, uh, galleries are you represented by? I only sell to this one man who is very wealthy. Oh, that's and he's, it? That's it. And he sets, he sets, he, I sent him a, a robe and it was $17,000 and he sent me 20000 Oh, he insured it for twenty already. So. And yeah. uh, where's he out of? He's out of uh, San Jose. Oh, okay. Okay. He has his collection though is near the Canadian border. Okay. Yeah, he's very famous. He buys everything I make. <laughs> oh, well, that, I wish I had a patron like that. That's that's. <laughs> I'd love that. That'd be great. Yeah. That'd be great. So, what are your plans for the next? year or so you have your book I have a book that I have to be working on and um, so in the next in August I'm going to go to Ottawa and do the um, the pictures for the book mm -hmm. so, yeah. and how long do you think it's going to take you to probably two years two years it's, it's because what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about living in the village mm-hmm and because so many things have changed in the village, you know, we still used our traditional clam baskets, seaweed baskets when I was a child because they were so much um, better because the clams, clam basket had holes so that you went out and washed your clams out in the ocean and then you brought them back to the box and they were clean when you, they mm -hmm. were clean of sand when you put it in the box. And then the seaweed, you would harvest the seaweed, the edible seaweed. And then when you were uh, through harvesting, you hung them up so that the excess salt water came off. And then you laid it out. We used sheets during my time, but I guess they used to use other things. When I, they lay it on the sheets and then let them dry in the sun. And then they usually chop it up, mm -hmm. the edible seaweed. And berries, they used to pick berries in berry baskets. And so I'm writing about those things that we still did, because I'm 75. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm writing about those things that we use, the kind of baskets. So it's going to go around, it's going to go along talking about the village and then back here in the back will be the instructions. So people who want to read oh, so that part of it, it will be a, a book, how-to book. Oh, very so, good. So the first part would just be telling the story of how baskets were used and then back. Are you going to put in a uh, little excerpt about symbols? and with their meanings or um i don't know i think that um erna gunther did a good job in writing that book so i don't think i'm gonna compete with her okay. i'll put some meanings but you know not a lot of them yeah a, a yeah. couple of years ago we were at the denver art center and they have a beautiful uh, uh native american weaving collection and out of uh larger they look like uh, surgical tubes they make an enlarged version of the weave and it's really quite beautiful. Oh, uh-huh. So. Yeah, I've, I've been in Denver. It's very nice. Yeah, I went to the University of Colorado too, summer, some summers. So. Where haven't you gone to school? <laughs> 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 oh, that's amazing. Is that about good enough? You think Hopefully. so? Yeah, yeah. We've got 20 more minutes of tape. Okay. So we, do, we don't have to fill it. We don't have okay, to fill good. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were looking through like a deer in the headlights there. <laughs> I have to work on my part. I have to change my clothes, get out of my okay. church clothes. Okay. Hi, I'm Barry Skirkus, Associate Professor from North Central College. Uh, and it's been an honor and a privilege to be here in the studio with uh, Dolores Churchill, a uh, 
well-known Haida Weaver, uh, Haida Weaver, and uh, she's been giving us a tour and explanations of uh, numerous artworks. And all this is made possible through a small grant from the Naperville Sunrise Rotary Club. They live up in the crags. There's one in New York City, though, those, um, oh, what is it? I can't think of the name right at this moment. But there are these birds of prey that attack uh, other birds. Oh, it's a uh, Cooper's hawk or a peregrine falcon. Peregrine falcon. There are two of them right there. And I guess one was trying to set up a territory because he, he attacked the one that was coming in. And it was just incredible. They're just it went right. one another. Right. It was amazing. <laughs> 